the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. A very warm welcome to you all to our service this morning, and a welcome to all those who are following us online. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil, and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. You raise the dead to life in the spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the torn and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, the Father of mercies, has reconciled the world to himself through the death and resurrection of his Son, Jesus Christ. By the ministry of reconciliation, entrusted by Christ to his church, receive his pardon and peace to stand before him in his strength alone, this day and evermore. Amen. Amen. second Sunday of Easter, let us pray. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be sit. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. <clears throat> you that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man, 
handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. 
For though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. I speak to God. Our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of God, our Creator, our risen Redeemer and Sanctifier. Amen. Amen. 
I'd, I'd love to begin a sermon one day using a text from that Acts reading that Kate just re read. <clears throat> These people are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. But I won't, it would only embarrass the organist. So, <clears throat> there's a number of interesting things in that gospel reading this morning from John that I won't talk about. But the one that really does strike me, as it may strike you, when you think about it and read it again, is that after all his, I will only believe if I put my finger in the scars, if I plunge my hand into the, his, his side. After all his demands, Thomas never does touch Jesus. His my Lord and my God is not after all based on the evidence he was asking for. I know it's always dangerous to base an argument on what the Bible doesn't say, but considering in this passage that it tells us what day of the week it was, who was there, where they were, how the door was locked and all the rest of it, I suspect if this important detail was important to the gospel writers, they would have put it in. The fact is that Thomas sees the risen Christ or the risen Christ comes to Thomas and that in itself is enough. Since the, I suppose, the beginning of the 1700s, <clears throat> evidence has become a hugely important part of our way of thinking, of our way of living, our way of doing justice, the way of living in society, and I think also in our faith. The 1700s were also called the, they were called the Enlightenment. Um, one of the stories I love is because the Enlightenment was the time when cheap wax candles were first invented. So even people like us could afford to have candles in our houses um, instead of those ghastly tallow lamps made from animal fat and guts and bits and pieces that stank like video and, um, <clears throat> and filled your lungs and your house with, the, with acrid smoke. So, in fact, in the early 1700s, cities did literally light up. And of course, it meant that people were able to work for longer, they were able to read more, they were able to, they were healthier. So it was a real change. And one of the other changes, of course, which is referred to when we talk about the same period as the age of reason, is that people began to call on science rather than superstition or superstitious religion to explain what happens in our lives. To understand something better, you look for causes. Up until that period, generalizing horrendously, if somebody made a proposition about the sun or the stars or the world or the shape of the globe or time or human beings, philosophers and scientists would go back to the classical sources and see what Plato or Aristotle or somebody said about it and then they would spend the next several hundred years arguing about the difference between the classical sources. One of my favourite stories, and this is only in the middle of the 1600s, so you can tell how quickly things changed over 50 or 60 years. <clears throat> there was a question that somebody asked Sir Thomas Brown, who was a great philosopher and a thinker and theologian in the, mid, in the middle of the 17th century, the 1600s. And they said to him, are a badger's left legs the same length as his right legs? It was clearly important to some people. And so Sir Thomas Brown, who was an experimental scientist, and he wasn't, you know, wasn't a kind of medievalist in that sense, he says, he tries to work it out using his brain, using his reason. He says, why would a badger's left legs be longer than their right? I can't think of any good reason. Have you ever seen any other of God's creatures whose legs are longer on the left than the right? And people thought about it and he said, no. I... So on the balance of probability, I think we can safely say that a badger's legs are all the same length. 
it doesn't seem to have occurred to him to go and catch a badger and measure the damn thing. It was still all very theoretical and until the 1700s, when very quickly, as science changed and as people's lives changed, if you wanted to believe something was true, you didn't take it on trust from someone in authority, as had always been the case in the past. You checked it out logically for yourself. A proposition needed to be backed up with proof, with evidence, and it had to be reasonable. It had to make sense. People began to think for themselves. And so, not surprisingly, not surprisingly a lot of the medieval ideas they'd been fed in church were rejected. <clears throat> I should say, I'm, I'm already regretting having told you the Badger story, because when you go home and somebody says, it's a nice service, and you'll say, yeah, we had a sermon about badgers. <laughs> Try and put that out of your head. Most of the clever thinkers of the 1700s continued to believe in God. Their idea of God had to change, of course. In fact, their idea of God got bigger. Instead of inhabiting the same realm as the fairies and the trolls, and the things that made your crops fail and your horse drop dead, which was how God had been understood along with all that other superstitious stuff beforehand. Their God was understood to be as big and bigger than the universe the scientists were discovering with their telescopes and their calculations. The more they discovered about light and disease and the stars and the planets and the human body, the more there was to wonder at. There was no real conflict between religious faith and science then. God was the maker of all things, as we say still in the creed, seen and unseen, discovered and undiscovered, things we know about, things we don't know about, things we don't know we don't know about. But it did become a problem later, as we all know. We all know how Darwin's theory of evolution caused a conservative backlash <clears throat> among those Christians who believed that the Bible was a source of historical evidence, which they thought science was trying to contradict. That's what we now call the category error. Once you understand the Bible as theological rather than historical, even in the bits that sound historical, then there is no conflict and a really interesting and exciting conversation opens up. But that sad old argument between faith and science has continued with media scientists and popular scientific writers asserting that science has now replaced faith as a way of understanding our lives. There can be no God, because you can't prove him scientifically, goes the mantra. Well, of course, God is, and never should have been, the filler we use to plug the gaps that science hasn't yet explained. But unfortunately, a whole generation of younger people now have been persuaded to that view, and unfortunately, too, there are churches still pumping out the old conflict argument science or religion and not enough bishops and preachers and teachers have engaged with it properly. If Thomas had put his finger into the scars on Jesus's hands and his hand into Jesus's wounded side that would have been evidence which may or may not have led him to believe. But the Gospel writers carefully tell us that faith is a different thing from that. Faith is a different way of knowing. It's not evidence-based. And John's Jesus finishes this passage by going one step further and saying, even those who have the evidence of their own eyes, even those to whom Jesus appears as he did to Thomas, they're less blessed than those who don't even have the evidence of their own eyes to persuade them. Knowing 
by faith is more like the knowing that goes on in a relationship. In fact, in a loving relationship, the evidence is often set aside. The fact that I forget my wife's wedding anniversary and my own um, doesn't mean that she walks out. The fact that, you know, only one of our grandchildren, well, yet anyway, <clears throat> The fact that only one of our grandchildren never writes a thank you letter doesn't stop me loving him all the, you know, just as much as the rest. There are aspects of relationship that aren't dependent on evidence and enduring love, forgiveness, knowing the door is open, there's an opportunity to start again, all those things. Of course, the irony is once you have made your step of Thomas-like faith, my Lord and my God, you see evidence everywhere for the existence and the activity of God. In the wonder of creation, in people, in love, in, in the wonder of science itself. But that's the result of believing, not the other way around. Because you can't persuade, you can't prove people into faith, and you can't argue people into faith either however hard we try. There's good old Peter on his soapbox in Jerusalem trying to persuade his fellow Israelites that Jesus is the real thing by reference to various Old Testament prophecies. Now, who knows whether it worked for them, but it certainly doesn't work today. Few people I've ever come across, don't about you, have ever been argued into faith, especially by keen Christians. People may acknowledge the possibility of the existence of a God, you know, probably, possibly there is something bigger than maybe there is something, you know, behind all this, maybe it's not all an accident, but that's not at all that kind of intellectual, yeah, well, I suppose it's possible, isn't the same thing at all, is it, as Thomas's my Lord and my God. Faith is properly called a gift, it's not something you make up for yourself. You receive it from God. It may be a call, a, stir, a stirring somewhere in your deepest being, a sense that somebody knows you by name, wants you, loves you, that you're not an insignificant accident of history, but that your life has meaning and value and purpose, that it has been given. Faith often grows like grass through a crack in the concrete when your nice, steady life is disturbed or broken up. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about faith not based on evidence, but coming from a, a different part of the brain, different part of the heart, different part of the universe. But however mysterious our coming to faith may be, it's important that what we believe is not nonsense. The power of reason, with a capital R, the ability to think for ourselves, is one of our most godlike attributes. It's one of the things that theologians argue about in, in, um, <clears throat> in commenting on the book of Genesis, about being made in the image of God. One of the abilities of God is to reason and to think, and to have the mind and the will. And that's one of the things that we have been given as creatures made in God's image. Reason is the friend and ally of faith. You shall worship the Lord with all your mind, says Jesus, as well as everything else. Christianity is a reasonable religion. Unlike some others, Christianity is argumentative. You can take it to pieces. You can see how it works. And it helps no one when Christians talk gobbledygook or sound as if they live in a wholly different world from normal people. So Jesus does not ask us to separate our lives into the sacred and the secular. He doesn't ask us to talk about God as though science and technology and reason don't exist, nor to talk about the world and power and money and sex and politics as if God doesn't exist. Human knowledge our longing to understand everything, our ability to understand so much is one of the most distinctive things 
about human beings. Science will no doubt continue to transform life on our planet for good or ill. We are, for example, looking urgently to science, aren't we, to solve the environmental problems that science itself has largely created. We can relate to God through science as we can through nature or prayer or other people. But our Easter proclamation that Christ is alive and among us is not dependent on stories about, sto about stones and angels and burial cloths. Christ comes to us, it would be fabulous, it would be lovely to hear your stories about how Christ came to you in your first beginnings of faith. It's always the most exciting thing for Christians to talk to one another about and to share with other people too. Christ comes to us as he did to those first disciples in a host of unexpected ways, often unrecognised at first, often misunderstood, always personal. Think of the number of occasions of those resurrection stories in the Gospel when Jesus calls people by name. Mary, Thomas, Peter. Sometimes we only notice that it's happened in retrospect, mysteriously, quietly, in a way that prompts a simple response of wonder and worship and love. My Lord and my God. And the fact that we believe in a way that's adult and reasonable and open-minded may not amount to evidence that we can give to other people, but it may well be part of God's call to them that here we are as people who believe. Amen. We stand to confess our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken by the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please sit or kneel for the prayers. Heavenly Father, as we continue to praise you for new life through the resurrected Christ, we thank you for the signs of new life all around us.
promising the start of spring. Father, as the apostles proclaim the good news of the resurrection, inspire your church to make it known to all people. We pray for the Anglican Church in Tanzania, for Archbishop Membo Mandolwa as he leads the clergy and congregations of the 27 dioceses in that country. Within our diocese, we pray for Patton Church, Swindon, and their priest in charge, Joel Sales, as he encourages and supports his growing congregation to explore new ways of worship. Locally, we pray for Westbury Methodist Church and for the continuing partnership between us. We ask your blessing on Teddy Kalonga as he leads the leadership teams and congregations of the circuit. We pray for the work of the Bible Society on a global mission to bring the Bible to life for everyone. And we pray especially for their open book initiative and our team here in Westbury on Trim as we retell Bible stories to children in our local schools. Strengthen Justin, our Archbishop, Viv, our Bishop, and all your church, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, your world desperately needs your peace, internationally, nationally, and to us as individuals. We thank you for the 25 years of peace in Ireland that the Good Friday Agreement has brought, and pray that respect, dialogue, and cooperation between the communities will continue. We pray for Yemen, that the signs of peace made this week will grow into a lasting agreement that will benefit all people, especially those suffering unimaginable hardship. And we pray for peace in the Middle East, Ukraine, Myanmar, Sudan, and the many hotspots of the world. Give wisdom to all in authority. Direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> Father, we pray for families struggling at this time as the cost of living continues to rise. We thank you for the organisations and the charities that are working so hard to support them. We pray for children, teachers and support staff that the prospect of the new term beginning this week will be greeted with enthusiasm and commitment. We remember those young people preparing for exams during the next few weeks. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we might serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, have mercy on those who are so cast down by pain or anxiety that they cannot feel your divine love. Lighten their darkness with the light of the new life in Christ. In a moment of silence, we bring to Christ those we know who are suffering today. And we remember especially Jackie and Ted Hipkin, Rita, Miles, Tony Rivers, Gillian Withers, 
Jan and Vicky and family, Lorraine, David Speller, Michael Steer, Max Wall, William, Tony Niblett, Matt, Paul Johnson, Reverend Cheryl Hawkins, Sean Harvey, Reverend Jeff Evans, Wade Stevenson, Gloria Simmons, Gladys Feeney, and Angela Shaw. And in our ongoing prayers, we remember Terry Cross, Charlie and his family, Lee Hawksford, Diane Randall, Thomas, Matt and his family, Lao Ming Herring, Naomi Bong, Denise Elliott, and Michael Hammond. Give them all courage and hope in their troubles, and may they know your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember before you those who have died. Renew us and their families and friends with resurrection hope that while weeping lingers in the night, joy will come in the morning. And we pray for those who have recently died. Edna Clark, Rod, Ron Sims, Mavis Gray, and Sister Gillian, SSC. And we remember those whose anniversary of death occurs this week. Peggy Coombs, Bob Christmas, Jill Maguire. Grant them all a share in your kingdom. May they rest in peace. And rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Just to highlight some of the things which are on your service sheets. Tonight at 6.30, we have a memorial service here, the quarterly service. And next week, it's a united service here at 6.30. As you will have seen, the reordering work at St. Paul, St. Peter's and Paul's room have started this week. Um, accessible toilets will be available in the car park and temporary arrangements are being made for serving coffee on Sunday. We're fortunate we can still use St Paul's room this morning. Um, you will have seen the builder's compound has been set up. We just need to avoid parking at church if possible and if it's possible just use it as a drop off and pick up point. Um, and we need, also need to keep it free for uh, emergency vehicles if necessary. The drawings and plans are at the back of church and if you've got any questions speak to Kate or Keith Yendall. Thank you to all those involved in providing Advent lunches this year, soup makers, biscuit makers, waiters, washers up, setting up tables, etc. A total of £426.54 was raised, plus an additional £106.63 for, uh, by gift aid for Christian Aid. And all the lunches I know were greatly appreciated. The church electoral roll, if you're not on the church electoral roll and would like your name added in time for this year's annual parochial church meeting on the 21st of May. There's a form you need to complete which is at the back of church and return to the parish office by midday on Friday the 5th of May. The revised roll will be on display in church from the 7th of May and any additions after that cannot be made until the 21st of May. Um, it, Margaret McGregor is our electoral roll officer and can answer any queries on that. 
Big Brew 2023, donations are still welcome. There are quizzes for fair trade prizes available for a pound from Ken and return by April the 23rd, please. Um, I'm sure you're aware emergency alerts is going to be sent out onto mobile phones by the government on the 23rd of April. Um, it's a test to the, their emergency systems. It's designed to keep people safe from things like extreme weather, but the alerts might endanger someone sharing a home with an abuser who has a secret phone as part of their safety plan. Advice on how to switch off the alert can be found via the link on the pew sheet. Please note switching the phone to silent will not stop the alarm. Uh, Winchester Pilgrim Meeting will be held at 9.30 um, on the 22nd of April. Bike riders need to complete their application and medical forms. And on the same day there is a, a, a gate maintenance group going to be painting the gates and making them look nice again. That's all I have. Um, I think the, the men have had a curry night for a number of years and I think Sally now wants to come and talk about the event for the ladies. Good morning everybody. Um, this is for the ladies of the um, congregation. Um, I've organised a ladies night out and it's going to be in Il Sapor in the village on the 24th of May and it'll be £20 a head that includes a pasta or a pizza and a glass of wine. There are several choices of pasta and pizza and um, I have these leaflets so if anyone's interested just come to me and I can give you these and um, we can go from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will you please stand for the peace? <clears throat> The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. It is right to give. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to the Lord. It is indeed right our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works, who by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise and opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory. You are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks he gave it to them saying drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of Blessed Mary and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, through our Saviour Jesus Christ, you have assured your children of eternal life and in baptism have made us one with him. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your love, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We who in the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this Easter tide and always. Amen. Go in peace, uh, in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.